Hi, today I want to talk about wire bonding, which is used in the semiconductor industry to make connections from the outside world onto silicon chips. In the video I'll be using 25 micron diameter gold wire to do this, but gold and aluminum wire is commonly used and uh, wire bonded onto gold, aluminum, and even copper pads. On the left you see a chip I made where the aluminum pads around its perimeter are um, wire bonded with gold wire to the leaf ring on the outside of it. And on the right you see the wire bonder that uh, I use for this purpose. This is a close-up so you can see a better view of what's going on. In industry, these machines are highly automated and extremely fast. You need a high-speed camera to even see what's going on and they have incredible repeatability. My setup for this is basically completely the opposite. It's very slow and completely manual, but very well suited to one-off prototypes and small, small production runs. You can see the wedge tool coming down in contact with the chip and making the first bond. The wire is pulled out across the gap and um, the wedge tool is brought back down into contact to make the second bond on the gold pad. After the second bond is done, the wedge tool is abruptly snapped backwards and it tears off the remaining wire and leaves a little sticking out at the end of the tool as a tail to start the next bond. So there are two main approaches to this. There's wedge and ball bonding. I won't go over the specifics, but you can look it up on your own and see in this diagram kind of what's going on. Ball bonding is used mainly in the industry today, and it's a lot faster. I'll be using wedge bonding, and it was the workhorse in the 70s and 80s, and is considered a thermosonic or thermocompression process, where a combination of heat, ultrasonic energy, and pressure is used to create an intermetallic bond between the aluminum or gold wire and the chip's bond pad. My quest for getting one of these machines started well over a year ago when I knew nothing about them. I started by picking up this high bond ball bonder off eBay. The seller said it was working, which was a lie, because uh, it was missing a number of components and it had some serious damage internally. I ended up returning that and getting another one by the brand of Kulik and Sofa. And a huge thanks to Jeremy Gordon for helping me get this. It's through generous donations and help like that, which I'm able to do these awesome projects at home and share them with you guys. Thanks again. So let's get to it. I'll show you some demos and uh, show you around the machine in a bit. But first we've got to let it warm up. I just switched on the heated work holder power supply and the machine itself. The work holder, or in the chip you're bonding, is held at around 150 degrees C to facilitate the bonding. That's heating up now, and the machine itself is going to calibrate. The work holder is on a uh, motorized linear stage, which has to run out to its maximum and minimum points to calibrate itself. Then we can use the machine. As I said before, this is the work holder where your chip goes. And uh, this is the power supply for that heater. This is the mouse, which is sometimes, sometimes called a chess man. And that allows you to manually move the stage. There's a number of controls for the various settings and power, force, and time of the bond parameters, which have to be tweaked. I actually found it kind of funny. This machine with the mouse or chess man on the left is considered a right-handed machine. And it's what you'll uh, find the most of when you're looking around on eBay. And that's because they figure your settings may not be perfect and the bonds may not be perfectly reliable. So you usually have to uh, need your, your right hand free to hold tweezers. So you can put them in there and poke things around or move broken bonds, things like that. And your left hand stays on the mouse the whole time. And let's start at the top of the machine. This is a holder for two inch spools of wire. I have gold loaded now. You can just barely see the hair-like wire threaded through the top of there. And after it comes out of that holder, the wire snakes and maneuvers its way around a number of clamps and pressure plates as it goes all the way down to the needle. When loading new wire, it takes me, an amateur at this, about 30 minutes or an hour to thread it through all the various clamps and things to get it um, directly to the bottom of the bond head. There's a spool, and the, the white spool above there is for a half-inch uh, wire, and which is not being used now you can see a small clamp, which I'm actuating manually here, which holds the wire. And finally the wedge tool, where the wire just barely pokes out the bottom of, and it's threaded through like a needle. The machine's almost warmed up, so we'll get to that in a second. Real quick, these are an example of chips I've made. Here are the most recent four that are perfectly wire bonded. And you can imagine how exciting that was when it finally worked. They're held in these chip carriers manufactured by Kyocera. Those were 
24 pin uh, ceramic dips. I've got a number of these. I have no reliable source for them, but you can find them around on eBay or sometimes people's personal sites. This is the gold wire I'm using. I picked it up off eBay, a couple of rolls, uh, spools of it. And I've also got some aluminum wire. Both are 25 micron. The machine can handle wire down to 20 micron and as thick as I think 75. And it can also do flat ribbons with a uh, change of the wedge tool. That's for high power devices like MOSFETs and things. This is the aluminum wire here. That aluminum wire is on a half inch spool, so as you saw before, there's the holder. This machine is kind of nice because it can accommodate uh, both types, as you saw before, the two inch holder. Close up of one of those Kyocera ceramic dip jip carriers. Now it's time to actually do this. So before we bond, the wire has to be properly threaded through the wedge tool, and you'll see why in a second. I'll remove the heated work holder so I don't burn my hand on it while doing this step. Now the wedge tool is pretty complicated. The wire comes down axially through the center of it and pops out the back at an angle. Then we have to reinsert the wire at a 45 degree angle toward the front. You'll see why later. I'm going to spin the wedge tool around 180 and uh, that will allow us to get a better view of what's going on and make my life easier to thread the wire through there. So now we're looking through the microscope eyepiece at the rear of that wedge tool. The wire comes out, as you saw, axially through the center of that, like a needle. And then I've got to grab it and then insert it through a 45 degree hole that has been drilled in the very, very tip of that um, wedge tool. You can barely see it. This was really difficult for me to do while looking through the camera because everything was reversed. Left was right and right was left. So I gave up after a few minutes of this and took the camera out, did it looking through the uh, microscope eyepiece, and then I'll put the camera back so you can see what it looks like when it's correct. You can see just how hard it is to get it through that hole without uh, bangling the, the wire end. And I eventually got it. You can see here what it looks like when everything's good. And I'm just pulling the wire through the front of that to make sure we're ready for a bond. At this point, I'll put the work holder back and we can go for it. The chip I'll be doing for a demo uh, I've used to calibrate all the settings and probably done a few hundred test bonds on, so it's really scratched up and it's a total mess. After you make bonds to a metal surface, it gets pitted and um, kind of scratched up. You can rip off the bond wire and try again, but there's only so many times you can do it. And you'll see just how bad those metal surfaces look under the microscope. Once everything's dialed in, the settings are right, it's quite easy and fun. We're looking through the eyepiece once again. And there's a long wire sticking out on this first bond, but the next one will have a shorter tail. So as you saw before, the first one goes to the aluminum pad on the chip, the second bond to the gold pad. It tears off and leaves a little tail to start the next bond at the edge of the wedge tool. And we can go ahead and do this all day long. There's a second one. The settings definitely take quite some time to get right. On the left here we have settings for reverse, tail, and tear. And these are for after it makes the second bond. The tail is how much uh, wire it will leave sticking out of the wedge tool to make the next bond. And if that's too short, your bonds will fail. On the right we have the settings for the actual bonds. The top is the first bond, the bottom row of knobs is the second bond. And on the left we have the loop control, which is how high it moves the tool in between them so you can make kind of a loop in the wire and not short out the wire against the surface of the chip. The knob label search is the search height, which it goes to before you make the first and second bonds. Then we have force, time, and power, which are pretty self-explanatory. 
My approach to getting this right was kind of a strategic trial and error until the bonds were one, reliable, and two, looked like other bonds. So this is a chip I decapped and put under the electron microscope so I could see exactly what the bonds were supposed to look like. This is another view of a bond growing, a little bit slower than the one we just did, so you can see exactly what's going on. And the settings are pretty well optimized here for a nice bond. But it's not always that nice. With the same exact settings, this time, you'll see complete failure on the second bond. So the first one's good, but on the second one here, it tears up the pad due to poor metal adhesion. And this is something I struggled with for a very long time. I've got pages of notes from when I was trying to figure out how to beat this. It turns out that the metal adhesion is really difficult to uh, get right. Thoroughly cleaning the substrate first with uh, things like Piranha Etch, acetone, isopropyl alcohol, and water seem to help quite a lot, as well as dehydrating the surface under high temperature. Aside from that, doing the depositions of aluminum or whatever metal at the lowest vacuum possible, so to achieve the highest level of cleanliness in there, really seems to help. I start the depositions around 7 times 10 to the negative 7 tour. They always end a lot higher than that because of outgassing, but starting it lower seems to help. And high deposition rates also allow um, for a lower probability of gas to be incorporated into the film as it's deposited, and that also leads to a uh, better adhesion. These films are thermally evaporated using either a tungsten boat full of aluminum pellets or a tungsten wire with aluminum wire wrapped around it and a few hundred amps going through it, so it glows red hot and melts the aluminum. I found a thickness of one micron is required at a minimum for the aluminum, and I generally try to go two or two and a half microns. I also got a working process with copper, but it was a little more complicated and required other adhesion layers. A very thin layer of titanium or chromium underneath the uh, metal layer between the silicon dioxide passivation and the metal helps with adhesion of the copper. And then another thin layer on top of the copper prevents oxidation, and uh, it's thin enough so that the wire bonder can blow through it without any issue and still make reliable contact to the copper. In both of these cases, I had successful bonds with uh, gold wire at 150 degrees C onto copper and aluminum pads. In the uh, real, in real labs and in industry, they want to avoid depositing such thick films over one or two microns because it takes a long time and uh, a lot of material in the vacuum. So they normally do electroless plating of, say, nickel and thick, soft gold on top, which also makes a very reliable bond. Oftentimes, these platings can be as thick as 4 to 10 microns, and it's a lot easier for them to bond wires to it that way. So that's it for this video. I hope you learned something, and thanks for watching.